Welcome everybody to this global webinar on demand-driven digital solutions and innovations in support of the COVID-19 vaccine deployments. Uh, this is the third uh, webinar in this series uh, that we have been delivering over the last week or so. Um, and today uh, we will have speakers from different organizations talking about different um, topics around this um, how we countries can uh, deploy digital solutions for the COVAX response and COVID vaccine deployments from uh, funding opportunities. We have speakers from Gavi and the Global Fund, as well as technical assistance available. My name is Karin Schilander and I'm a senior health advisor in UNICEF. I'm also the unit chief for digital health and information systems. And with that, I'm going to just quickly walk you through what uh, we are going to cover today in, in this meeting. We have um, just a few um, uh, picture slides on the need and context for digital solutions for COVID-19 vaccines. We are going to talk a bit about innovation priority areas and digital solutions, as well as funding opportunities, the, how we can um, the technical assistance and opportunities to build in data and digital solutions and innovations into the digital uh, national vaccine and sorry vaccine national deployment and vaccination plans that each country is is producing the technical assistance that is available and some upcoming webinars and resources that are available if you would like to know more so with that, I will hand over to another colleague from uh, the World Health Organization. So I want to invite Diana. I hope that you can have access to the microphone. Uh, I can, yes. Thank you so much, very much, Karen. So greetings, everybody. My name is Diana Chang-Blank. I'm the team lead for immunization program strengthening in WHO, and I will just run through a few slides to give you an overall context on where we stand right now on COVID-19 vaccination. So there have about, been about 3.6 billion doses of vaccines um, administered so far in 215 countries and territories. And in fact, this is probably a bit out of date because it's a couple of days old already and it's quite a fast moving um, universe. Uh, COVAX uh, has shipped 100 million doses or so to 135 participants and immunization has not yet started in five countries economies and territories and those are countries that um, have um, other dynamics going on such as for instance haiti next So even though that sounds quite tremendous, um, the number of doses that have been administered, it's really highly concentrated in the high income countries, as you can imagine. So if you see, this is a timeline from December 2020 to July 2021. Uh, the largest uh, proportion, 80 doses per 100 population is given in high income countries. And if you eyeball down those lines, uh, you see that the low income countries are giving in contrast 1.3 doses per 100 population. So there are very large gaps uh, in terms of equity globally. Uh, it has improved since February uh, where there was 10,000 more doses given in the high income countries than the current picture in low income countries, which is 60. Um, so it's an improving picture, but you can see that the gap is quite uh, gaping still. Next. However, on the positive side, the expectation is that supply will liberate globally, uh, particularly towards the very end of this year, where AMC uh, 90 one country, uh, which is normally 92, but India is not accounted for here because of the special circumstances, are estimated to receive about 2 billion additional doses, um, the majority coming from COVAX and a portion from bilateral deals. 
So in essence, um, you know, it's sort of a famine or feast situation where all of a sudden now there will be a rainfall of vaccines in terms of quantity, but also in terms of diversity of products. So there's a lot that needs to get done to support countries in positioning themselves to receive those vaccines. Next. So given this um, surge that um, we are positioning ourselves to support countries in accommodating, uh, countries are encouraged to look at their national vaccination plans. Many of those vaccination plans were written in de December or January when, um, in fact, we didn't actually have any WHO EU or vaccines yet. Um, so encouraging countries to relook really at their national um, development and um, deployment and vaccination plans. Uh, and as well, look at the costing associated with those plans to see what revisions um, would be required. And that uh, NDVP and costed budget can be submitted to the partners platform. Uh, I think countries are already familiar with that mechanism uh, to uh, continue to share uh, with others uh, what the challenges are and the technical assistance and budget needs are that would be required to accommodate um, for the accelerated introduction of COVID-19 vaccines. Next. Next. So in terms of the um, costing itself, uh, there are great needs. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there are also a number of donors, bilateral and multilateral, that have pledged assistance uh, to support countries in the operational rollout. So about 2.3 billion has been pledged through the 30th of June, uh, and you see the different actors here. Um, some of the um, funds that you see according to each of the actors are not necessarily um, funds that have been implemented with country, within countries or received in countries, but there are many channels and mechanisms for uh, the target countries and the priority countries to access the funds uh, that are being um, earmarked um, by these different donor agencies to provide support for facilitating vaccine introduction. And this is a very dynamic picture. It changes uh, daily. Um, And this is my last slide. So in addition to obviously the challenges with the financing that um, is required, there's also obviously a surge that would be required with respect to human resource support and technical assistance needs. Um, you will see here on the far right, uh, a different uh, exercise that has been costed out by UNICEF in terms of the delivery costs and the human resource scale-ups. Uh, particularly being dramatic in the low and middle income countries. Um, and this will uh, require, you know, very careful strategies on the part of countries on how to position themselves to be able to receive the vaccines and implement and monitor implementation effectively. And I believe that's my last slide, Karen. Thank you so much, Diana. So now we're moving into um, another set of slides of the presentation, which is talking specifically about how we believe digital solutions and innovative practices can support the COVID-19 vaccine delivery. And uh, there's no need to mention how, how we already all know how low and middle income countries are severely stressed in their health systems in their abilities to plan and administer and, and monitor the vaccination and rollout. But we do know, and we knew early on that, if we, there are robust and ready to scale innovations and digital solutions that potentially could be deployed as part of this COVID response that could um, more effectively and efficiently um, support the vaccine uh, deployment, but also uh, do it in a more equitable way using data. And uh, we, we also know that if we do this well, and if we do it in the, in the right way at this, 
at this time, we can also see more equitable coverage of other quality health services because these solutions can clearly be um, deployed in a way that they can address COVID and uh, strengthen other, other health services uh, in, in how they are deployed. Um, so with that, I, I was going to hand over to my colleague uh, Derek Munene from WHO to speak a little bit about how uh, digital interventions can support this rollout. So Derek, can you share your mic? Can, do you have uh, access to your microphone? Yes, thank you so much, Karine. Um, just double checking if you can hear me. I do have access to the mic now. Thank you so much. Great, Derek. Thank you so much. My name is Derek Munene. I work for the World Health Organization as the head of capacity building and uh, collaboration. And at the same time, a focal point uh, for the new uh, initiative uh, that amplifies existing work called the Digital Health Center of Excellence, together with my colleague at WHO, uh, Dr. Garrett Mill. Uh, both uh, Dr. Garrett Mill and myself function uh, within the Digital Health and Innovation Department uh, at WHO. And within the next uh, seven minutes or so, I'll be speaking to you about um, the enabling environment that we're working on and with to really enable the production of appropriate digital tools to take us to a uh, scale, uh, both for the current context of COVID vaccination uh, uh, management and also the general agenda of uh, digital health uh, for health system strengthening. Uh, on the next slide, what you actually will be seeing is uh, the a new WHO global strategy on digital health and its four objectives. The digital health uh, strategy was approved last year and covers a space of uh, five years with four objectives. And these four objectives really try to ensure that digital solutions uh, of any kind, of, of any type and of any size are actually deployed in a manner that they can be sustained. And so really thinking about how we promote national collaboration uh, around digital health uh, implementation, including knowledge transfer, making sure that countries are enabled to support various digital, digital health interventions, and also thinking about how do we indeed uh, use digital health strategies as an entry point for all things digital, and making sure that countries have appropriate governance mechanisms to support the digital health interventions, uh, both at the you know, country level, regional level, and also at the global level. And then lastly, thinking about how do we ensure that digital solutions are deployed in such a way that they're safe, they put people first, and they advance global, regional, and national targets, including the aspirations towards uh, universal health uh, uh, coverage itself. And so this then being the framework uh, for our work, uh, the current discussions around um, uh, you know, COVID uh, sub, uh, vaccination management, including supply chain management, really find their home in the four pillars of uh, the global strategy on digital health. On the next slide, what you'll be seeing is an existing framework that we've used over the years with its enabling environment, really thinking about all solutions that are digital, finding a home around the leadership and governance structure, around the investment uh, structure, and really thinking about uh, ensuring that uh, different digital solutions and services themselves have an appropriate space whereby they can be, um, you know, are enumerated within a classification scheme and that the standards themselves are applied to these uh, solutions, including making sure that the uh, appropriate infrastructure is in place and legislation and policy uh, itself put in place together with making sure that there is an adaptable, future-proof, digitally capable health workforce. And so this enabling environment is an enabler for the global strategy itself and ensuring that the digital solutions themselves that we are promoting uh, positioned in such a way that they can scale for the future. Now, really stepping back um, in terms of the progress made within vaccine management, what you see on the next slide is a situation that uh, most of us are quite familiar. Uh, the issue around uh, uh, penetration of uh, digital solutions uh, for within the immunization program has been a subject of concern for many years, and the number of digital tools that have been produced in that space the key issue, of course, there has been ensuring that these uh, digital tools that had been deployed for immunization and vaccine management are integrated within the larger health system strengthening program. Uh, that's been a challenge in the past, uh, given the fragmented nature of uh, existing solutions that are made for other services. But we see that COVID-19 has provided for us a catalyst 
to really strengthen countries' capacity around record keeping, uh, making sure that uh, records themselves uh, for electronic management are linked towards uh, you know, digital tools that support humanization, and really ensuring that the COVID-19 itself being a catalyst enables us to have um, uh, you know, a more robust, more comprehensive routine humanization services for COVID-19 and beyond. And so what you see on the next slide, therefore, uh, is a group that's been working on uh, this uh, particular agenda around uh, using COVID-19 as a catalyst, as an entry point. Uh, so within the COVID-19 Vaccine Delivery Innovation Network stream of work, uh, of course, uh, within the uh, uh, auspices of uh, COVAX, there is a number of uh, entities that are contributing towards the agenda of supporting vaccine supply uh, management together with uh, the appropriate digital tools to support the uh, overall um, a, a framework or spectrum of digital health interventions for this area of work. Uh, we have a number of uh, entities within WHO, within UNICEF, and within the GAP uh, Secretariat, uh, as you can see listed out there, for lack of time, I'll not go through. But suffice us to mention that these particular entities have been working on a number of work streams that you see on the next slide. Uh, these work streams uh, on the next slide speak to the key areas that the uh, innovation, uh, COVAX Innovation Working Group has been working on as, as problem statements that require addressing to amplify, deploy digital tools to, su uh, to support the uh, COVID vaccine delivery mechanism. And these uh, work streams themselves have actually uh, you know, evolved themselves into specific streams of work. Uh, beginning by thinking about micro planning. As most of us are aware, the key challenge that we have around micro planning is that the population that we are dealing with is very diverse and very little is known about the population. And so there is, of course, a challenge on making sure that we leave no one behind and also making sure that the uh, supply chain itself addresses the right population based upon where they are. There are opportunities, of course, in this area to deploy innovative uh, 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 solutions, including a GIS as a method. A GIS has been used uh, for other programs, such as polio, for example, quite successfully. It has also been used to map where facilities are, mapping where populations exist. And so this is one area that is critical for us to really invest, and this work stream is really trying to leverage a GIS as a method to ensure that we leave no one behind and that we are addressing populations where they are. There's a couple of benefits, of course, to this particular intervention, including making sure that the targeted populations are identified and that the services themselves are quite comprehensive and leaving no one behind and no population are, are, are unattended to. And the enormous advantages around uh, making sure that populations, facilities, uh, including uh, where services are being provided are also uh, accurately mapped. Uh, and so this is one intervention and one work stream that uh, 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 the working group is working on. Uh, on the next slide uh, is another intervention that has to do with uh, counterfeit uh, detection, making sure that falsification is uh, eliminated. This has been an area of concern, of course, within the overall routine health systems. Uh, you know, the question of counterfeits has been a big issue. But with COVID now, as you heard from the first presentation, uh, the issue of uh, being able to detect a counterfeit is critical. Based upon, of course, the progress of the pandemic, uh, it has more become a concern now based upon the global nature of this particular situation. And so the challenge is quite clear. We have so, so many, you know, uh, we have high volumes of vaccines that are being created and the potential for falsification, not only of the vaccine, but also of the documentation that comes with the vaccines themselves is quite high. There's a number of opportunities in terms of addressing this item, uh, in terms of using uh, digital solutions to ensure that there's an appropriate registry that can handle legitimate uh, you know, products in such a way that the actual supply chain itself can be tracked. The benefits we have for this particular intervention include, of course, uh, increasing patient safety and trust and making sure that the security of the supply chain itself is enhanced and also making sure that the demand, public uh, demand is increased and the trust in the public system is also enhanced. Uh, on the next example is uh, uh, another uh, work area that has to do with uh, making sure that we're monitoring the coverage of uh, the program itself in terms of vaccination. Of course, uh, the key challenge is knowing who is actually getting access to these particular products, where, and in what quality. 
And how do we ensure that equity is and, and effectiveness is, is, is monitored? Uh, this particular work stream uh, has a number of uh, opportunities for digitalization, including the ability for us to uh, move to an electronic platform, the registration of vaccination doses administered, as, also as, as was presented by the first speaker, and really leveraging mobile applications that are able to track the entire life cycle of uh, vaccination uh, 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 management are uh, using mobile apps, for example, that have cap capabilities for offline management. And then, of course, the next uh, area of work is around uh, being able to, to plan in a real-time fashion the logistics around this particular uh, program. The challenge is quite clear, uh, being able to get a handle on uh, uh, the progress of uh, the implementation and using uh, uh, maps to actually see where services are being uh, 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 provided is, is a big challenge. And once again, digital solutions provide for us opportunities for us to be able to visually see the progress of our implementation. The benefits are straightforward for this intervention. The more visible we are, the more coordinated uh, we, we actually can be. And then on the next slide uh, is uh, the whole issue of how do we measure uh, adverse events and monitoring, uh, making sure that as patients are consuming uh, products, we're able to uh, ensure that we're detecting in real time uh, any adverse uh, you know, uh, events that occur. This is critical, of course, for public confidence. It's also critical for us to ensure safety uh, of patients. And so there is uh, uh, the, the, the challenge of being able to get a handle on uh, adverse events as they occur. Digital solutions, of course, give us an opportunity because using uh, digital tools, we're able to indeed track uh, and trace events as they occur in a real time fashion. The benefits are quite clear. Once we're able to demonstrate that we're able to you know, track and trace uh, these events, public confidence, patient confidence, in this case, consumer confidence uh, is increased. And we're also better able to um, uh, ensure that we have an understanding of the issues that are causing these adverse events as they occur. And then, of course, uh, uh, lastly, but by no means not, not the least, is the whole question on how we ensure that we are keeping track of uh, uh, the vaccination uptake uh, by patients. And so there is a, uh, the main challenge of making sure that we're, we're, we're tracking or at least we're enabling patients to keep a record of their vaccination status uh, using uh, 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 digital tools. In the past, this has been done through paper tools. Uh, many of us are familiar with the uh, uh, you know, uh, fever vaccination card. And the, the main challenge right now is that paper cards can easily be falsified, paper cards can easily be destroyed. Paper cards can pose a challenge with cross-border transactions. And so the innovation um, benefit we have here is being able to create uh, an architecture that enables us to store uh, the digital, uh, the, the, the vaccination uh, test results, uh, the vaccination test results together with uh, the vaccination status itself. Uh, the main issue here is how do we enable uh, patients to carry in a portable manner the one, test results, and number two, the vaccination status. And so there is an opportunity for us to use QR codes for paper-based implementation and also uh, mobile devices for uh, storing the QR codes so that it can indeed be used as a point of reference, either at the point of entry or at the point of exit. Many benefits uh, occur as a result of this, including continuity of care and also supporting cross-border uh, you know, uh, transactions, especially as more and more countries are opening borders to allow for international traffic. Uh, these are some of the interventions that uh, the working groups are working on. And so I'll pause here and hand over the floor to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Derek. I'll hand over here to Karin Gashen from Gavi. Hello. Good morning, everyone. So uh, sorry, my, my camera does not work, but you can see my picture. I'm Karin, and I'm working at uh, Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccination. And uh, I'm the focal point for digital health information uh, system across the organization. So maybe we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, so uh, as you know, uh, it's uh, really important to, to invest in the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Now that uh, vaccines have been uh, reaching the countries, as, as you have seen from the slide from Diana. And uh, while we want to really support the, the delivery of uh, COVID-19 vaccines, we also want to invest 
in, in the system that can also support routine immunization. So the benefits are, are doubled. So it's also a big momentum at the moment. I think uh, uh, we are very happy because everyone speaks about vaccines and all of that, but it's uh, really important to invest in the right way. Uh, so you can see the, the list of all the investments uh, that are, are so important. And uh, in interest of time, let's move to the next slide, please. So I will present two slides on how you can access funding via Gavi. And uh, I think my colleague, my colleague Nick will uh, uh, detail for the Global Fund for Gavi. Uh, we have made funding available not just for the Gavi eligible country, but for what we call the Gavi AM, the, sorry, the AMC 92 countries. And this is already open and you can access what we call the uh, CDS early uh, window. And all the uh, country have received communication from the senior country manager for the uh, Gavi countries and also some via UNICEF. The window is open and it will be open until uh, end of August for the early access window. And you can go via the, platinum, the partner platform, sorry. So you will have all the information there. And if there is any issue, you can contact uh, Gavi, the senior country manager. Of course, uh, this is an early window and the additional funding window will be open uh, in August next month and you will have more detail at that time. But already in an early access window, you can uh, ask support for what we call innovation. So Gavi encouraged all the countries to invest, uh, you know, at least 15%, this is an indication of the CDS funding toward innovation. And this support can be uh, directed for operational costs like training, uh, IT equipment, tablet, uh, all of that, internet connectivity, server cost, uh, all those uh, operational costs can be covered and also technical assistance. So what we define as a, an innovation for COVID-19 is a, really the use of practices, products, and services new to COVID-19 vaccine delivery in a country. And we have two principles. We really encourage you know, to have a strong government ownership and that um, we also encourage countries to invest in innovations that are already grounded in a, in a in new country. And that, you know, you are comfortable with it and uh, is in innovation that has been maybe piloted in one or two districts for COVID-19 and you want to use us funding to scale this um, intervention that is already proven, but you want to scale it for the entire country. Or you can also use us funding uh, to tailor some um, innovation that exists in the country, but for something else than COVID-19. So for example, if you use a NIL MIS system for, for other commodities and you want to use it for COVID-19 uh, vaccine as well. So this is the way we, um, we want to encourage you. So is um, you can really take the best from for your country specific challenges. So maybe you can move to the next slide, please. We have made um, a guidance available uh, that we have shared with all the country. And in that guidance, we have given some examples of what we call innovative intervention. And they are all classified within uh, following the NDVP areas. So this is an illustration and you will have seen that all the um, innovation that um, were mentioned so far, they are all covered there. And there is even some more. So please just uh, fill in your, your form for the overall request and you can include in the source uh, support for innovation for Gavi. And uh, um, contact uh, Gavi or WHO UNICEF for, for any further detail. Over, I think to Nick. Great, um, thank you, Karine, and, and thanks, Karen. Um, 
Good morning and afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'm honored to be with you today. My name is Nick Oliphant. I'm a senior malaria specialist with the malaria team at the Global Fund. And I'm going to talk to you briefly today about uh, Global Fund's C19 RM funding. Uh, in April 2020, the Global Fund created uh, the C19 RM to help countries respond to COVID-19 and mitigate its impact on HIV, TB, malaria programs and health systems, as well as community systems. To date, uh, 3.7 billion has been raised by the C19 RM, and uh, 1.34 billion have been approved in 119 countries and multi-country grants. Um, some important points to note on uh, this funding stream uh, are that um, countries with current uh, 2020 to 2022 Global Fund allocations or grants are eligible for C19 RM funding. Uh, applicants can request funding through a full funding application and on an optional fast track application, application basis. Uh, countries are eligible for a base allocation of up to 15% of their total 2020 to uh, 2022 uh, grant allocation. And in addition, they are eligible for an above base allocation of up to 15%. Um, it's also important to note that countries can reprogram savings or funds from their existing C19RM um, allocations or fund, uh, grants um, following global fund guidelines. Um, there's a link provided there. Um, it's important also to note that vaccine procure procurement is not eligible. Um, and uh, while vaccine delivery is not the main or primary focus, uh, system support for um, NDVPs uh, is eligible. All applications must be approved by all members of the country coordinating mechanism. Uh, and in addition, control and containment interventions related to COVID-19 must be approved by the national coordinating body for the COVID-19 response. Any investments related to vaccine delivery should be aligned with the NDVP. Um, for more information, you can go to our website dedicated to C19RM. Uh, there's a link in the presentation. And thanks back to uh, Karen. Great, thank you, everyone. Um, now I want to go into um, the next a uh, chapter of this webinar, which is around technical assistance available to help uh, countries who might need some extra technical assistance to build in these digital solutions that we had heard about earlier today and add that or, or sort of include that in their Gavia Global Fund or other funding proposals that are in the shaping and, and also on the technical assistance that you can request to um, to decide on which solutions are maybe the most appropriate. And I wanted to kick this off starting with uh, the introduction of a new initiative that we call the DICE, the Digital Health Center of Excellence. And this um, initiative was started in uh, early, earlier this year, around February. Um, as, and it's set up as a multi-agency consortium where UNICEF and WHO are co-hosting the virtual secretariat and whereas in UNICEF are running the day-to-day -day activities. And it's a way to ensure that countries who now request technical assistance for leveraging digital solution, solutions can get coordinated and standardized support um, to respond to these requests when it comes to the preparation and deployment of mature digital technologies that can support COVID-19 and vaccine delivery, but also support health system strengthening more broadly. And we're also using the DICE mechanism to align these requests with donor agency support and to ensure that um, any requests from governments is brought to the attention of donors who are working in this space. And the way we are operating is to uh, address these five principles that um, both within WHO and UNICEF and we work very closely with other partners. We're not using this mechanism to, to uh, control all the technical assistance by any means, but it's really just to try to provide better support uh, to countries who need urgent, urgent um, 
uh, support for these systems and solutions and want to be demand driven. So we want to make sure that we prioritize country requests that align with the national deployment of vaccination plans. We want to be agile so that we support with contracting mechanisms of approved vendors and technical experts in this space who can kind of come and provide short term response. We want this uh, support to lead to more sustainable deployments of digital solutions so that we support the existing systems, uh, either tweaking or modifying existing solutions, or if, if nothing exists that can be utilized, then bring in solutions or recommend solutions that um, can be not only cost effective for COVID, but also later integrated into the into the health management information system and potentially utilized more broadly for other health services. We also take security very, um, um, it's a very important part of this initiative to make sure that the solutions that are being introduced are safe from um, uh, where the data privacy can be safe and, and that they apply with security standards around cybersecurity and, and, and so on. And lastly, to build capacity as we go along so that we uh, support the governments to take up solutions that can be quickly owned by, by governments themselves and where there's enough technical capacity to maintain these over time. So who supports DICE today? So we have three sort of levels of uh, support whereby we have some partners who are the uh, participating organizations who have put in funding to um, run this initiative and make sure that it's successful from the early start, including Gavi, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, USAID, NGIZ. And then we have a number of partners who we meet with on a weekly basis who is supporting and endorsing this initiative and who are also collaborating with their local country offices to ensure that requests and support is coming through this mechanism. And we have a number of private sector partners we are in, in conversation with who are also interested in either providing funding to this initiative or in-kind support. What areas can we um, support? So while I should say it's not a funding mechanism per se, it's really around the coordination of technical assistance. And it can be things like uh, coordinating between donors, and development partners at regional and, and global level. It can be around helping to review concept notes, terms of references, investment cases, funding proposals, etc. Um, to provide guidance and support to implementation and assessment tools to do the business analysis and mapping out existing platforms that already exist and see where there are gaps and where there are opportunities and so on. So. Um, a lot of different areas of technical assistance and how can support re be requested we can either um, you can uh, write an email to our gen generic email inbox which is listed here um, and these support requests should be from should be endorsed by government they can be submitted by implementing partners as long as they are sort of part of a, a broader government conversation and have should have been uh, gone going through existing technical working groups or donor coordinating mechanisms at country level uh, before they they are submitted to the dice um, request portal and um, yeah as i mentioned technical assistance should ideally be aligned with the national deployment and vaccination plans and when support is provided it is not bypassing existing mechanisms so it's really done through whatever structures already exist including um, the government structures technical working groups the un organizations um, uh, the the dice consortium partners etc so with that i'll also talk a hand over to a colleague to present one slide on a uh, specific area of work around GIS solutions and a working group that has been formed around that to support micro planning. So over to you, Ravi, to just give a brief overview of this working group and what support you can provide. Thank you, Karim. Uh, the WHO UNICEF working group on GIS started in February and it covers five big areas. One is to understand the needs at the country level. So we first had an you know, assessment um, you know, form or a survey with the countries to understand what exactly is the need on the GIS or the digital micro plan. Digital micro plan is as simple as, as this, having a satellite imagery, having knowing where the people are living, marking your health facilities, 
having a drive time analysis to your nearest health facility. So this is the whole thing which we are trying to um, you know, bring into the digital micro plan. To do that, we wanted to understand what is the capacity or the what is the availability right now in in the country in terms of um, the, these various baseline information. So that is the first component of this as a tool. The next one is also there are a lot of donors and vendors who are really engaged in this area. We are not the first people to do this, right? So we really. Uh, uh, Early on, we realized that there are so many people there. So we brought all the vendors into a technical working group. We have up to now uh, 40 to 50 technical uh, partners who, who are there in the in the technical working group who had um, who had or willing or were already engaging with the countries. So what we did is we did a, um, a process called benchmarking. So every uh, vendor is identified. What is the area of your strength? What is that you can offer? And have you worked in these countries? Uh, what is the um, engagement or current engagement with the countries? So those sort of basic information were collected and it has been benchmarked for them. So that gives um, a portfolio for the countries to quickly go through these vendors. Okay, these are the vendors who have this capability in my country so I can engage with them. So that is the idea of building a technical portfolio. It is not an RFP, it is not that process. It's a step just before that to understand who are all existing there. Then is, we also prepared some information note with our colleagues, um, uh, uh, Kareen and, and Nicholas and the working group to facilitate the filling up of the application form, how to actually apply for a grant for GIS work area. So that is an information note which we prepared on that. And, and um, Gavi funding is straightforward and, and Karen mentioned about it so that if you need some information, you can reach to us. And one of the information we did is we wanted um, uh, countries to be helped with how much money actually we need to do the whole process of digital micro plan. So we built a, uh, a simple Excel calculator, which with basic information you feed in, it will give you approximately the amount you need to run through the process of uh, digital micro plan. Um, if the country is already prepared with some information, might be you need less across and also the capacity of GIS in the country also plays an important role in the budgeting tool. All these were considered into the budgeting tool and Excel calculate. We can we are happy to share that with with the countries. And finally, what we are working now is already there have been some documents done by various entities and also by by UNICEF and and Gavi on this uh, digital micro plan. So what we are trying to do is like we call it as a handbook or a playbook or a cookbook where if the country wants to implement digital micro plan, what is the step? A to step Z. So if if a country wants to do this practically in a country, so they could go through this document and understand, okay, these are the steps I need to go through and I have done this. It's more like a checklist, also a guiding um, uh, document for them. So right now we are we are in the stage where, where we had consulted with many countries and for the you know, global fund funding, actually Nick is there might be up to 10 countries or so actually had requested for money um, for GIS or the digital micro plan and, and um, they're in the final stages. Similar to that, um, I know that um, uh, Karen mentioned that Gavi is encouraging this to go up to 15% of their funding for digital innovation and GIS was one of that. Thank you, Karen. Great, thank you, Ravi. So just to now wrap up with some final slides on, there's a, um, I'll be, we'll be sharing this presentation after the, after the meeting and you will find here some resources and contact persons and email addresses that you can reach out to if you have any uh, questions or if there are specific requests around technical assistance that might be uh, helpful to you and i've posted this uh, specifically from a who and unicef perspective the, the key focal points at regional level who would be great if you could include in such conversations and then just to end we are doing a number of webinars on these topics there was already one on uh, GIS specifics uh, specific to the Africa region, which um, hopefully with with the Ravi, I'll ask if there is a recording we can share as well for that webinar. And we also have a, a YouTube channel which you can log into where there's a link here where we are including all the past webinars and we already have um, some recordings there of how to use real time planning and monitoring for vaccine distribution and on uh, electronic 
logistics management information systems. And I will start now a poll because I would love to hear from you what other areas you are interested to have more deep dive focused webinars on. And we are trying to, to respond to, to, to your needs as much as possible. So I would love to hear from all of you which topics are important and from which region um, you are in so that we can um, plan these webinars a little bit better going forward. So with that, um, I'm going to end the, the presentations and we would love to hear more questions from you. And there has been already some questions coming in in the Q&A. So perhaps we can also address some of these live. So I can call upon um, some of the presenters to respond. Let's see what we have that is open in the... Um, maybe I can ask Nick to start. There's a question on innovative transport solutions such as drone delivery. Uh, Nick, can you start to just explain, is that something that can be included in the Global Fund? Um, portfolio around yeah. drone and hi, hi yeah I, I mean I think um, it's 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 possible you know again it would have to be um, you know something that is prioritized by the country and approved by the CCM aligned to the uh, NDVP and to the national COVID response plan so um, with those check boxes in place, it seems like it could be included in a request. Uh, whether or not it would get prioritized would be, you know, up to the, um, well, up to the country and up to the uh, investment committees in terms of their decisions. Great. Maybe I'll ask that same question to Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. I think it's easier to to respond uh, uh, already so it is fine for for to include that in a gavi request is um, uh, perfectly eligible after it's all about timing uh, you know gavi has experience about drone delivery and um, is a lot of regulation to go through so it's better if the country have already piloted this already uh, uh, undertake some uh, um you know process with the regulatory authority and all of that so like that for implementation it will be faster because if it's just to try for the first time it can take up to two years just to 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 go through so uh, in the context of the pandemic we want to uh, uh, the gavi funds to be used for rapid scale up so for something that have been already intro introduced in the country but in principle it is fine to request this within the the, the gavi proposal over. Thank you, Karine. And since we have you, I wonder if I can ask the next question to you on Gavi's support to electronic immunization registries. And especially, there's a question from Joseph around um, whether there is support to multiple country interest. Um, when, when there is a request that goes beyond the country, is that something that can be included in Gavi's support? So again, um, it's, it's possible uh, to include that in a, in a country request for Gavi CDS funding. After there is some caveat to that uh, generic uh, uh, answer from my side. The first one is, um, you know, the, the, the EIR for COVID-19 specific is quite simple and, 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 and we have seen some successful implementation so far in few countries for COVID-19. So it could be okay now the full uh, electronic immunization registry is something complex so far very few uh, gavi supported countries have uh, um, been successful for that uh, challenge to scale this up for at the as a national level so we have to be very careful so um, is eligible a country can apply but we really encourage uh, a, a deep discussion with uh, who unicef and and gavi and and other partners country by country and uh, of course uh, if it's a regional for multiple countries uh, uh, more deep discussion have to be engaged as well but in principle it's feasible and and please discuss with the technical focal point over super um maybe nick is there anything to add from global fund on that question no i think um i think um going covered it um i would just uh 
advise people to go to our website uh, and there are, there's detailed guidance on what is eligible and, and um, would uh, provide, I think, more information in terms of the, the scope and the boundaries of, uh, of eligibility. Thanks, Nick. And I wonder, Nick, if, uh, since I have you here, can you talk a little bit about one question that came in around uh, digital solutions to support health workforce planning and training? and maybe summarize some of the responses you gave to that question. Sure, uh, happy to. Um, so yeah, people can go to the chat and I wonder that, I think that's probably gonna be distributed too, but if not, in any case, um, if you go to the chat, there's, uh, my, my answers are there, but indeed the, we are um, encouraging, in fact, countries to use digital solutions um, around health uh, workforce uh, issues and challenges in the context of COVID-19, including around training um, and meetings and such, um, but also for planning. Um, so I've provided a few e examples there and some direct quotes from our technical information notes, uh, which really underscore the eligibility of these kinds of investments. Um, I'd also just like to flag that um, in addition to the technical information note in the GIS technical note from WHO and UNICEF, it's also highlighted um, where, for instance, um, master, national master uh, list for CHWs and registries for those um, are also um, eligible for investment through um, C19RM. Um, so those are just some examples, but again, please go to the website, look through the technical information uh, notes, and you will see what is uh, the contours of what's eligible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. And I wanted to check with Clayton from WHO uh, Euro if you want to add anything to that and uh, technical products that you mentioned coming up in this area. Right. Thanks very much, Karen. No, I think um, I think so far it's been really adequately um, captured. I've been uh, trying to look at some of the excellent suggestions which have come through on the chat. One of the ones which I think actually uh, we can collectively take up is a, a fail fest webinar to actually look at those initiatives which have not worked. And again, I think that's something that the DICE in particular can actually build from. Uh, taking both uh, best practice examples and and where we have to be cautious moving forward. Not notably also was the, the request for more information on health workforce supporting in this particular area. So again, that's something that, that both uh, WHO and UNICEF have in the works. So again, much to be done, but a lot has already been said, which is excellent. Thanks again, Karen. Thanks, Clayton. That's great. And that's a great idea to maybe not just look at what has worked, but really understand better why some things didn't work, because we do know that we have it. many countries. Um, I think we talk a little about globally, we often talk about an 86% failure rate of innovations, which is which is not um, super <laughs> positive, but it's important to look at why why we have those uh, situations. So that's something we will definitely think about how we can address. And I think that was a question, a really good question on, um, are there any vetted solutions for digital innovations? And are there similar to what, I guess, what Ravi was talking about, how they brought all the vendors together. And in the digital solution space, we're very lucky to have um, a broad community of global stakeholders working around bringing out global good solutions. And it's, so far we work very closely with, it has, so far, that work has been very closely coordinated by Digital Square, and we work very closely with them on this so that we um, can always uh, promote and suggest solutions that uh, have been vetted by the, by the Digital Square mechanism, as well as uh, um, the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which is also working to bring out and vet uh, new global goods that have been developed specifically for COVID or for uh, immunization delivery management. So there are indeed a number of solutions and vendors that um, we know have products that apply the various standards that are important when it comes to open source licensing and, and security standards and so on. So yes, if uh, we can include a link to the Digital Square resources in this, where you can see uh, which solutions already are vetted and approved and which ones have even been modified specifically for COVID response. 
Um, I think those are the questions we have. Just to also say in the poll, it looks like the questions, uh, the, the topics where there is most interest uh, to have further webinars is around digital communication to increase demand and, and manage misinformation. We do know that this is an issue all over the world and it's really reducing uptake of, of vaccines. So we, we have a lot of work that has been happening in this area when it comes both to applying or incorporating digital communication channels and uh, maybe, I don't know if BP, you're still online. Do you want to talk a little bit about the experiences in, in your region in uh, applying chatbots and digital communication tools that we could potentially hear more about if we set up a webinar around this topic? Hi, thanks, Karen. Hi, hello, everyone. Yes, uh, so in uh, this region, we have been trying a few different options. And one of them is this chatbot called Help Buddy. You may have heard about it. Uh, this uh, chatbot is actually available uh, in multiple languages with the option of uh, natural language processing as well. And as uh, Kevin mentioned, maybe considering the, the you know, interest coming from number of colleagues, we can organize a webinar focusing on this digital communication, including the, the experience from the Health Buddy project. Thank you. Thank you, BP. I think we need to definitely include these experiences from that in if we set up a webinar. So I think those were all questions we have received and we are at time. So I want to thank all the presenters, all the participants for staying with us. And we will share both the recording as well as the slides and the resources after this meeting. And we'll make sure that you all get that today. And um, Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if you know of any opportunities where we can work with you, provide, providing technical assistance. And so thank you and have a great uh, week and um, uh, hope to speak to you soon. Bye for now.